Kidney stone disease, also known as nephrolithiasis, specifically refers to calculi in the kidneys. Calculi can be formed anywhere in the urinary tract. However, they are commonly found in the renal pelvis and ureters. Renal calculi and ureteral calculi are often discussed together, and ureteral calculi almost always originate in the kidneys, although they continue to grow once lodged in the ureters. Kidney stone disease is one of the most common urological conditions around the world. Its incidence and prevalence rates have been increasing over the last few decades. It is more common in males than in females. Usual age at presentation is between 20 to 40 years. So, before we proceed to our original topic, we may recall some basic anatomy of the urinary tract. Here we have the kidneys, ureters, and the bladder. Ureters join the renal pelvis of each kidney at the ureteropelvic junction. And the junction at which ureters join the bladder is known as the ureterovesical junction. Here we have a simple diagram of a kidney. The outermost connective tissue layer of the kidney is known as the renal capsule. Then we have the renal cortex. Renal medulla consists of renal pyramids that contain the collecting ducts of the nephrons. Urine from the collecting ducts drain into the renal papillae and then into the renal calluses and renal pelvis. Now let's discuss about the pathophysiology of urinary stone disease. There are four major types of renal calculi. Calcium stones, which account for about 75% of all urinary stones. Magnesium ammonium phosphate stones, also known as struvite stones or triple stones. Uric acid stones. And cysteine stones. In addition to these, there are some less common types of stones, including xanthine, dihydroxyadenine, and drug-induced stones. All these types of stones contain an organic matrix that is made up of mucopratanes. Urinary stone disease is caused by two basic phenomena. In both of these instances, stone-forming constituents need a nidus to precipitate on. This nidus could be a foreign body or any type of crystal. First one is supersaturation of urine by stone-forming constituents, such as calcium, oxalate, and uric acid. In supersaturation, what happens is that the concentrations of these ions exceed their solubility, which enable them to precipitate on an appropriate nidus, leading to stone formation. The second phenomenon is deposition of stone-forming material on a special type of nidus, called a Randall's plaque. This mechanism is most likely responsible for calcium oxalate stones. Randall's plaques are calcium phosphate precipitates that can be seen in the subepithelial space of the renal papillae. With time, stone matrix, calcium phosphate, and calcium oxalate gradually deposit on the Randall's plaque to form a calculus. In this image, a Randall's plaque is denoted by the small white dot in the renal papilla. Now let's discuss about the causes of urinary stone disease. Several factors are responsible for the formation of urinary stones. Environmental factors play a major role. These include low fluid intake and dehydration, for example, long-term exposure to sunlight where people work outdoors. In both of these occasions, blood volume decreases, which results in low GFR and low urine output. So, urine will be supersaturated with stone-forming constituents, leaving the person at risk for developing urinary stones. Genetic factors also play a role in kidney stone disease. Family history of urinary stones is a major risk factor. And several genes are implicated in kidney stone disease, including genes that are responsible for renal tubular handling of stone-forming substrates, such as calcium, oxalate, and phosphate, as well as inhibitors of stone formation, such as citrate and magnesium. Metabolic abnormalities also play a huge role in formation of kidney stones. Hypercalciuria, or excess calcium in urine, is the commonest metabolic abnormality. Hypercalciuria occurs in two forms. Hypercalciuria with hypercalcemia, which is commonly seen in hyperparathyroidism. And idiopathic hypercalciuria, a condition where there is excess calcium in urine, without hypercalcemia. In idiopathic hypercalciuria, there is increased intestinal absorption of calcium, which is known as absorptive hypercalciuria. And in some patients of this group, there is a primary renal defect in calcium reabsorption, 
leading to excess calcium in urine, which is known as renal leak hypercalciuria. High uric acid levels in blood favor the formation of uric acid stones. Cystinuria is the major cause for cysteine stones. Hyperoxaluria, or high oxalate levels in urine, is another metabolic abnormality, especially for the formation of calcium oxalate stones. This could be due to a genetic defect, also known as primary hyperoxaluria, or due to defects in intestinal absorption of oxalate, known as enteric hyperoxaluria, or maybe due to high intake of oxalate, known as dietary hyperoxaluria. Some common foods that are rich in oxalate include chocolate, spinach, and nuts. As mentioned earlier, certain types of drugs also induce formation of kidney stones. Some of them include the following. Antiviral drugs like indinover and adizanover, guifenesin, triamterine, silicate drugs, and sulfa drugs like sulfadiazine. Long-term alterations in urinary pH is another cause. Persistent acidic urine favors the formation of uric acid and cysteine stones, whereas persistent alkaline urine favors the formation of calcium phosphate and magnesium ammonium phosphate stones. Chronic infections in the urinary tract also promote formation of urinary tract stones, especially magnesium ammonium phosphate stones. Now let's discuss about the different types of stones in more detail. About 75% of all the renal calculi are calcium stones. They may contain only calcium oxalate, or a mixture of calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate. They are hard and small in size. Typically there are multiple stones. Their surface may be smooth, rounded, or jagged. Calcium oxalate stones are usually radio-opaque, meaning that they can be visualized in an X-ray. Magnesium ammonium phosphate stones account for about 15% of renal calculi. They are predominantly associated with chronic urinary tract infections with gram-negative, urus-positive organisms. Urus is an enzyme that splits urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. Major organisms in this group include Proteus, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella species. E. coli is not capable of splitting urea, therefore it is not associated with struvite stones. Ammonia is alkaline, therefore, the pH of urine rises above 7, which favors the formation of struvite stones. These stones are gray-white in color, and they are often large, and fill up the pelvic callosal system, which look like a staghorn. Therefore, they are often referred to as staghorn calculi. In this picture, you can see a large staghorn calculus filling up the entire renal pelvis. Like calcium stones, they are also radio-opaque and are visible on an X-ray. Uric acid stones account for about 6% of renal calculi. They are typically associated with low pH in urine, high purine intake, such as organ meats, legumes, fish, and meat extracts, and conditions with high cell turnover, such as malignancies. Approximately 25% of patients with uric acid stones have gout. They are yellow-brown in color, small, and hard. Often there are multiple stones. Unlike other types of calculi we discussed so far, uric acid stones are radiolucent and cannot be visualized by an X-ray. Cysteine stones account for about 2% of renal calculi. They form due to an intrinsic metabolic defect, resulting in failure of renal tubular reabsorption of the amino acids cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. So as a result, urine becomes supersaturated with cysteine, leading to deposition of cysteine crystals. They are white-yellow in color, soft, and waxy. And they are slightly radio-opaque. Now let's see what are the signs and symptoms of urinary stone disease. Urinary stone disease may be clinically silent if the calculus is small and non-obstructing or located within the kidneys. Symptoms usually appear when the calculi pass down distally along the ureter and obstruct the urine outflow. Renal colic is the term used for the pain caused by renal calculi. Renal colic is probably the most excruciatingly painful event a person can endure. Striking without warning, this pain is often described as being worse than childbirth, broken bones, gunshot wounds, burns, or surgery. 
Patients with staghorn calculi are also often asymptomatic. These stones may manifest as infection and hematuria, rather than as acute pain. Asymptomatic bilateral obstruction, which is usually uncommon, manifests as symptoms of acute renal failure. As mentioned earlier, most calculi originate in the kidneys and proceed distally along the ureters. Location and quality of the pain caused by these stones are related to the position of the calculus in the urinary tract. Severity of the pain is determined by the degree of obstruction caused by the stone, presence or absence of ureteral spasm, and presence or absence of any infection. Stones lodged in the ureteropelvic junction causes severe flank pain without radiating to the groin due to the distension of the renal capsule. Flank pain is usually felt in the back or sides of the abdomen. Stones lodged within the ureters cause abrupt, severe colicky pain in the flank that radiates to the ipsilateral lower abdomen and groin area. Stones lodged in the ureterovesical junction also cause irritative voiding symptoms in addition to the renal colic. These include increased urinary frequency and dysuria. If the stone is located within the intramural ureter, symptoms may appear similar to cystitis or urethritis. These include suprapubic pain, increased urinary frequency and urgency, dysuria, and gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea and tenesmus. Calculi in the bladder are usually asymptomatic and are passed relatively easily during urination. Renal colic actually has three clinical phases and the entire renal colic typically lasts between 3 to 18 hours. Phase 1 is the acute or onset phase. Renal colic attack usually starts early in the morning or at night, wakening the patient from sleep. The pain is steady and increasingly severe. Phase 2 is the constant phase. Pain remains constant in this phase until it is treated or allowed to diminish spontaneously. Phase 3 is the abatement or relief phase. Pain diminishes fairly quickly during this phase. Other symptoms of urinary stone disease include the following. Nausea and vomiting, which is seen in approximately 50% of patients with acute renal colic. Gross or microscopic hematuria due to damage to the mucosal layer of the urinary tract. And tachycardia and hypertension. Fever is typically not a symptom of urinary stone disease. However, if a calculus is complicated by an infection, patient may have fever, pyuria, and leukocytosis. Urinary stone disease is associated with some complications. If a stone obstructs the urinary outflow persistently, patient may develop hydronephrosis or buildup of urine above the obstruction. This may lead to upper urinary tract infections. If the infection persists, it can rapidly lead to sepsis because the kidney is a highly vascularized organ. With serious infections, there could be abscess formation, ureteral perforation, and loss of renal function. If there is extensive damage to the ureters, the damage will be repaired by fibrosis. This may lead to formation of ureteral strictures because fibrous tissue tends to contract to reduce the size of the scar, as you may have learned in your general pathology. Persistent or recurrent stones may also give rise to chronic renal failure. Moreover, chronic renal stones lead to squamous metaplasia of the urethelium, which ultimately predisposes to squamous cell carcinoma, commonly in the bladder. Diagnosis of urinary stones is often made on the basis of clinical symptoms alone. Although confirmatory tests are usually performed, Imaging studies include x-ray of kidneys, ureters, and bladder to visualize the stones because about 90% of stones are radio-opaque. On this plain x-ray image, a kidney stone is denoted by the white arrow. Intravenous or retrograde pelography. Ultrasound scan of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder. And CT scan of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, which is the most sensitive imaging test. Commonly performed laboratory tests include the following. Urine full report to detect red cells, pus cells, infected crystals, and to measure the pH of urine. Renal function tests to assess the kidney function. These include serum creatinine, blood urea, and serum electrolytes. Tests to identify metabolic causes of renal stones. These include plasma calcium and uric acid levels, 24-hour urinary volume, 
and 24-hour excretion of calcium, oxalate, and urea. And, analysis of the stones if available. Finally let's discuss about the management of kidney stones. Treatment of urinary stones involves emergency management of the acute renal colic and medical or surgical therapy to remove or dissolve the stones. Medical treatment of acute stone attacks involves supportive care with intravenous hydration to reduce dehydration and increase the urine output. Analgesics to relieve pain including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, acetaminophen, or morphine. Antiemetics, to relieve nausea, including metoclopramide and ondansetron. And appropriate antibiotics. In some cases, dissolution of the stones is possible. Calculi compost predominantly of calcium cannot be dissolved with medical therapy. However, medical therapy is important in long-term chemoprophylaxis to prevent further growth and recurrences of calcium stones. This includes treatment with thiazide, diuretics and potassium citrate, restriction of high salt and high protein foods, and increased water intake. Uric acid and cysteine stones can be dissolved with potassium citrate and sodium bicarbonate. In addition, allopurinol is given to treat high uric acid levels in blood. And alpha blockers are given to facilitate stone passage by allowing dilation of ureters. Stones that are 7 mm or larger are unlikely to pass spontaneously and require some type of surgical intervention, including stent placement, to facilitate the urine outflow. Percutaneous nephrostomy to drain excess urine in case of an obstruction. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, a technique in which a series of shockwaves are administered to break apart stones and allow them to pass out freely during urination. Endoscopic stone removal, also known as dormia basket. In this technique, an endoscope is inserted into the urinary tract to remove the stones. Percutaneous nephrostolithotomy, where a nephroscope is inserted through the skin into the kidney to remove the stones. If none of the above methods cannot get rid of the stones, open surgical procedures are made. Okay. That is all I wanted to discuss with you in this video. Hope you found it interesting and helpful. If you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you have any question or doubt regarding this topic, feel free to post them in the comment section. Thanks for watching. See you soon in the next video.